In the evening of the second day after its departure, the vessel drops anchor off Greenwich. Most of the passengers go ashore with the view of taking the stage up to the city. Peter, however, who considers that he already spent money enough to no purpose, the first remaining on board. We shall get to Billingsgate, says he, while I'm sleeping, and I shall have plenty of time to go home and dress and go in this, into the city and borrow the trifle I may want for Pester and Company's bill that comes due the day after tomorrow. This determination is a source of much trouble to our hero, as will be seen in the sequel. Some shopmen who remain with him in the packet tempt him to unusual indulgences in the way, first of brown stout, and secondly of positive French brandy. The consequence is that Mr. Snook falls thirdly asleep, and fourthly, overboard. About dawn on the morning after this event, Ephraim Hobson, the confidential clerk and fact factotum of Mr. Peter Snook is disturbed from sound sleep by the sudden appearance of his master. That gentleman seems to be quite in a bustle and delights Ephraim. With an account of a whacking wholesale order exclaims for ex exportation just received. Not a word to anybody about the matter, exclaims Peter with unusual infinite emphasis. It is such an opportunity as don't come often in a man's lifetime. There's a captain of a ship. He's an owner or two. But never mind. There ain't time to enter into particulars now, but you'll know all by and by. All you have to do is do as I tell you, so come along. Setting Ephraim to work. With directions to pack up directly, immediately all of his goods in the shop, with the exception of a few trifling articles, the master avows his intention of going to the city to borrow enough money to make a pester's bill due tomorrow. I don't think you want much, sir, replied Hobbs, Mr. Hobson, with self-complaints and error. I've been looking about long windedness You see, since you've been gone, I've got Shy's money in slash count, which we'd pretty much given up for a bad job, and one or two more. There, there's a list. And there's the key to the strong box where you'll find the money, besides afterwards. Besides what I've took at the counter. Peter, at this, seems well pleased and shortly after goes out, saying he cannot tell when he'll be back, and giving directions that whatever goods he may be spent and sent in during his absence shall be left untouched till his return. It appears that after leaving his shop, Mr. Stook proceeded to that of Job. Flash Bill and Kirk Company. One of whose clerks on board the Rose in June had been looked had been very liberal in supplying our he hero with brandy on the night of his ducking. Looked over a large quantity of ducks and other goods, and finally made purchase of a choice arrangement to be delivered the same day. His next visit was to Mr. Bluff, the managing partner in the banking house where he usually kept his cash. His business now was to request permission to overdraw a hundred pounds for a few days. Huff, said Mr. Bluff. Money is very scarce, but... Bless me, yes, it's he. Excuse me a minute, Mr. Snook. There's a gentleman at the front counter whom I want particularly to speak to. I'll be back with you directly. As he uttered these words, he rushed out and, passing one of the clerks on his way forward, he whispered, Tell Scribe to look at Snook's account and let me know directly. 
He then went to the front counter, but where several people were waiting to pay and receive money. Fine weather this, Mr. Butt. What? You're not out of town like the rest of them? No, replied Mr. Butt, who kept a thriving gin shop. No, I stick to my business and make hay when the sun shines. That's my maxim. Wife up at night, I early up in the morning. The banker chatted and listened with great apparent interest till the closing of a huge book, on which he kept his eye, told him that he, his whispered order had been attended to. He then took a gracious leave of Mr. Butt and re returned back to the counting house with a slip of paper adroitly put in his hand while passing on which was written. Peter Snook, linen draper, Bishopgate Street, old account, increasingly gradually balance. One hundred and fifty three pounds, fifteen shillings, six D. Very regular. Sorry to keep you waiting, Mr. Snook, said he, but we must catch people while we can. Well, what is it you were saying you wanted us to do? I should like to be able to overdraw him for just a few days, said, Mr. said Peter. How much? A hundred? Won't fifty do? No, not quite, sir. Well, you're an honest fellow and don't come bothering us often, so I suppose we must not be too, too particular for, with you for this once. Leaving bluff, Mr. Snook hurries to overtake Mr. Butt, the dealer in spirits who had just left the banking house before himself, and to give that gentleman an order of the hog's head of the best gin. As he's personally unknown to Mr. Butt, he hands him a card on which is written, Peter Snook, linen and muslin warehouse. Bishop Gate Street within, etc., etc., and takes occasion to mention he purchases at the recommendation of Mr. Bluff. The gin is to be at Queen Height the same evening. The spirit dealer, as soon as he... His new customer has taken leave, revolves in his mind the oddity of the linen drapers buying a hogshead of gin, and determines to satisfy himself on Mr. Snook's responsibility by personal application to Mr. Bluff. On reaching the bank, however, he is told by the clerks that Mr. Bluff, being in attendance upon a committee of the House of Commons, will not be home at any reasonable time, but also that Peter of Snook is a pers perfectly safe man. The gin is accordingly sent, and several other large orders of different goods upon other houses are promptly fulfilled in the same manner. Meantime, Ephraim is busily engaged at home in receiving and inspecting the invoices of the various purchases as they arrive, at which employment he is occupied until dusk, when his master makes his appearance in the unusually high spirits. We must here be pardoned for copying some passages. Well, Ephraim, he exclaims, this looks something like business. You haven't had such a job in this many a day. Shop looks well now, eh? You know best, sir, replied Hobson, but hang me if I ain't frightened. When we shall sell all these goods, I'm sure I can't think. You talked of having a haberdashery side of the shop, but if we go on at this rate, we shall have what another side for ourselves. I'm sure I don't know where Miss Spot can just be put. Ah, uh, she go to Jericho," said Peter contemptuously. "As for the goods, my boy, they'll be gone before tomorrow morning. All you have, all you and I have to got to do, is to pack them up." So let us turn to and strap at it. Packing was Ephraim's favorite employment, but on the present occasion, he set to work with a heavy heart. His master, on the contrary, appeared full of life and spirits and quartered boxes, sewed up trusses, and packed huge paper parcels with a celerity and an adroitness truly wonderful. Why don't you get on, Hobson? He exclaimed. See what I've done. 
Where's the ink pot? Oh, here it is. And he proceeded to mark his packages with his initials and the letter G below. There, he resumed. P.S.G. That's for me at Gravesend. I want to meet the captain and owner there. Show the goods if there's any he don't like. Shall bring him back with me. Get bills. Banker's acceptances for the rest. See him safe on board, then, but not before. Mind that, Mr. Master Aframe. No, no. Keep my weather eye open, and as the men say on board, the, sh the rose in June. By the by, I haven't told you yet anything about my falling out aboard while in the river. Falling overboard? exclaimed the astonished shopman, quitting his occupation to stand erect to listen. Aye, aye, continued Peter. See, it won't do to tell long stories now. There, mark that trust, will you? Know all about it some day. Lucky job, though, I'll tell you that. Got this thundering order by it. Got one tumble first going off at Margate. Spoilt my pea green. Never mind. That was a lucky tumble, too. Hadn't been for that, shouldn't have gone so soon have found out the game that a certain person was playing with me. She go to Jericho. But for the frequent repetition of his favorite expression, Ephraim Hobson has since declared he shouldn't have doubted his master's identity during the whole of that evening, as there was something very singular about him, and his strength and activity in moving the bales, boxes, and trusses were such that he had never previously exhibited. The phrase con condemning this, that, or the other thing, or a person to, quote-unquote, go to Jericho, was the only expression that he uttered. As the shopman said, naturally, and Peter repeated that whimsical anathema as often as usual. The goods being all packed up, carts arrived to carry them all away. And by half past ten o'clock, the shop is entirely cleared, with the exception of some trifling articles, to make show on the shelves and counters. Two hackney coaches were called. Peter Snook, Mr. Peter Snook, get into one with a variety of loose articles, which would require too much time to pack, and shopping into another with some more. Arriving at Queen Height, they find all the goods previously sent already embarked in the hold of a long-decked barge, which lies near the shore. Mr. Snook now insists upon Ephraim's going on board and taking supper and some, and some hot rum and water. This advice he follows to so good a purpose that he is, at length, completely bewildered when his master takes up, taking him up on arms carries him on shore, and there, setting him down, leaves him to make the best of his way home as he can. About eight the next morning, Ephraim, awakening, of course, in a sad condition of both in mind and body, sets himself immediately about arranging the appearance of the shop, quote-unquote, so as to secure the credit of the concern. In spite as well as ingenuity, however... It maintains the poverty-stricken appearance, which circumstance excites some of the most unreasonable suspicions in the mind of Mr. Bluff's clerk upon his calling at ten, with Pester and Company's bill of 316 pounds, 17 shillings, and receiving by way of payment a check upon his own banking house for that amount, Mr. Snook having written this check up before his departure with the goods, and left it with Ephraim. On reaching the bank, however, therefore, the clerk inquires if Mr. Peter Snook's check is good for 316 pounds odd, and is told that it is not worth a farthing, Mr. S. having overdrawn for 100. While Mr. Bluff and his assistants are conversing on the subject, but 
the gin dealer calls to thank the banker for having recommended a customer, which the banker denies having done. An explanation ensues, and stop, thief, is the cry. Ephraim is sent for, and reluctantly made to tell all he knows of his master's proceedings on the day before, by which means that knowledge is obtained of the other houses. Who would have supposed to have been swindled?